Hi, I'm David Sedlak, a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. And today I want to tell you about Superfund contaminants, the next generation. At the start of World War I, Teddy Roosevelt got in touch with the U.S. government and offered his services. TR offered to bring back the Rough Riders, his cavalry corps, to help the fight in Europe. President Wilson respectfully listened to Roosevelt's offer and politely declined, recognizing that the day of the cavalry in fighting wars was over. That's a little bit like the situation that we're facing now with the next generation of Superfund contaminants. We've spent 30 years or so developing techniques to measure contaminants at hazardous waste sites, approaches to study the effects of contaminants on human health and the environment, and approaches for remediating the effects of contaminants to protect public health by returning water supplies to clean conditions. And now we're starting to recognize that there are contaminants that we hadn't been aware of before that are posing threats. So today I want to tell you a little about some of those threats, but before I do, I want to tell you something about how we got where we are and how the analytical detection techniques that are used by scientists to quantify contaminants in the environment have led us to look first at one group of contaminants and now are opening our eyes to a whole new generation of contaminants. So before I can tell you about that, maybe I'd start with a riddle. And the riddle I want to give you is this. What do Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's book that some people say sparked the environmental movement, the ozone hole, um, the problem with the sun's radiation reaching the Earth's surface due to uh, contaminants going into the stratosphere, and carcinogens in our disinfected drinking water have in common? Give up? They all have the electron capture detector in common. The electron capture detector was a device that was invented by Dr. James Lovelock in 1957. Lovelock, the scientist who popularized the Gaia hypothesis about how the Earth would take care of itself when faced with threats of pollution, had also been a gifted analytical chemist. And he developed this device called the electron capture detector that was particularly good at detecting compounds provided that they had multiple halogen groups attached to carbon compounds. And so coupling the electron capture detector with the gas chromatograph, we suddenly had a way to detect concentrations of contaminants at the part per million and part per billion levels, levels that we'd never been able to see before. And very quickly, we we were able to explain some of the problems that we were seeing in the environment. The disappearance of the brown pelican and the bald eagle, the hole in the ozone layer, and even the problem of cancer rates among people who drank chlorinated drinking water. Here are the molecules that were responsible for those problems. You can see on the left DDT, the pesticide that had bioaccumulated and caused the reproductive failures among brown pelicans and bald eagles. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbons, the compounds that went into the stratosphere and underwent photodegradation, releasing halogen atoms that broke down the ozone layer. And the trihalomethanes, these compounds like chloroform shown here, which are produced when you use chlorine to disinfect drinking water. So these compounds, primarily compounds that were amenable to gas chromat chromatography analysis, and most of which had chlorine atoms on them, became the bread and butter of the Superfund program. So for our first 30 years, uh, researchers interested in understanding potential threats posed by hazardous waste sites employed the gas chromatograph and the electron capture detector and focused on chlorinated compounds when they thought about uh, threats to public health or the need for approaches to remediate contamination. And that worked pretty well for us. But then, as we made progress on the chlorinated compounds, the PCEs and TCEs, the polychlorinated biphenyls, all of these other compounds, we started to recognize that there was more to the periodic table. In fact, just thinking about the halogen atoms shown here on the right, we recognize very clearly that if there are problems posed by chlorinated compounds, there might also be problems posed by the other halogenated compounds. So I want to tell you just briefly a story about two of the members of the halogen family, bromine and fluorine, and some of the new generation of contaminants that we're discovering that contain these atoms. So let's start by going down the periodic table at bromine. And one of the types of compounds that has become an interest to people uh, studying hazardous waste sites over the past 10 or 20 years has been the polybrominated diphenyl ethers. 
So here you see the structure of a compound called BDE, pentabromodiphenyl ether. This is a compound that's often found in furniture because it has properties that make it a good flame retardant. There are other compounds in this family. They might have more bromine atoms and they might have slightly different structures, but the brominated flame retardants are a family of compounds that we see has some of the same properties of the chlorinated compounds that were the interest of the Superfund site since Superfund program since the beginning. So for example here, if you look at this compound, uh, this compound here is pentabromodiphenyl ether. Uh, brominated diphenyl ether, it's called BDE-47 because that's the way in which they're numbered, but it's used as a flame retardant in furniture and electronics and other kinds of consumer goods. And looking at the structure of this molecule and thinking about its chlorinated cousins, things like the polychlorinated biophenyls or the, uh, the dioxins or dibenzofurans, you would expect that it would share the properties that we discovered in those compounds. That is, we would expect it would be persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And indeed, this compound is bioaccumulative. We can see it uh, being accumulated in lipid, in wildlife, or we can see it uh, building up in, in the tissues of people who are exposed to it in their homes. Um, it's toxic. It, it has a variety of health effects at relatively low concentrations. But as it turns out, it's not as persistent as we thought it was going to be. And part of the reason for its lower persistence are the weaker bonds between the carbons and the bromine atoms uh, as compared to the bonds between carbon and chlorine atoms. So about 10 years ago, when we first started getting interested in the brominated diphenyl ethers, my colleague Lisa Alvarez-Cohen, another one of the Superfund researchers, and one of her graduate students, Kristen Robrock, started studying these compounds and asked the question about whether they would degrade under the same sorts of conditions that uh, microbes had been able to degrade chlorinated compounds. And indeed, what we found in the research was that the brominated diphenyl ethers could undergo a process known as reductive dehalogenation, where the microbes are actually able to strip the bromines off of the molecule, making it a lot less toxic in the process. Process. And this process was much faster in the bromin for the brominated compounds than it has been for the chlorinated compounds, things like the polychlorinated bi biphenyls. So the good news about the brominated diphenyl ethers is that they're not as persistent as we thought they would be. The bad news is that they're bioaccumulative and toxic. And there's a, a variety of research projects taking place now trying to understand the health effects of these compounds, trying to understand their transport and their, the environment, and trying to develop ways to break them down. Now, if we move up in the periodic table, we encounter fluorine. And there aren't a lot of fluorinated compounds that are possible to detect with the gas chromatograph coupled to the electron capture detector. And so for many years, we really didn't think very much about fluorinated organic compounds and their present at ha presence at hazardous waste sites. But in the 1990s, developments by analytical chemists led to the production of a liquid chromatograph that could be coupled to a mass spectrometer. And this device, known as the HPLC-MS, has made it possible to discover the presence of fluorinated organic compounds in the environment. And the reason in which, why we needed the liquid chromatograph instead of the gas chromatograph is that many of the most important fluorinated compounds are charged under the conditions that you encounter in the environment. So what I'm showing here are two compounds that have turned out to be of considerable interest among the fluorinated organic compounds, uh, PFOA and PFOS. And these compounds have backbones that consist of carbon chains where the the hydrogens have been removed and replaced by fluorine. And these fully fluorinated compounds are very difficult to degrade. They're, they're very resistant to biotransformation and chemical oxidation because the carbon-fluorine bond is so strong. And then the right-hand side of the molecule, the carboxylic acid group or the sulfonic acid group are strong acids. So in the environment, they're going to be deprotonated, meaning that these molecules will have a negative charge. So they have the left-hand side of the molecule being, uh, being 
oleophobic or attracted to lipids, and the right-hand side of the molecule being charged means that they can't be analyzed by gas chromatography, but they can be analyzed by liquid chromatography with mass spectrometry. The presence of that charge and the oleophobic group also makes them excellent surfactants. And that turns out to be one of the main uses of PFOS and PFOA. They're used in a product called AFFF, aqueous film-forming foams, which are used by the military, shown here, uh, a picture of a crew fighting a fire on a Navy ship. Uh, they're used to fight fires because they form these wonderful foams that lay down on top of a fuel fire and smother it. And because of these carbon-fluorine bonds, they don't catch on fire themselves. And so these compounds, as we've started to have the ability to measure them in the environment, we're finding that they show up in groundwater and soil at sites where they were used, particularly military sites. But I'm sure as we start looking at more sites where they were used, they'll likely show up there as well. So as if that wasn't enough to worry about, these compounds with these nearly indestructible carbon-fluorine bonds on them, as we dug in a little deeper looking at this product called AFFF, we found that it's a lot more complicated than we thought. You can see here some of the many compounds that have been discovered in AFFF that's been used to fight fires. And what they all have in common is this perfluorinated chain group shown on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, these other functional groups with carbon chains containing nitrogen groups and sulfur groups that allow them to be anionic or cationic or zwitterionic. It gives them excellent properties that allow them to be used to fight fires, but it greatly complicates our life in terms of measuring the compounds in the environment and remediating the sites where there are contaminants. And so one of the strategies that we've been developing as part of our research to clean up sites where these fluorinated compounds might be present is to couple biotransformation with chemical transformation. So what you can see here in this figure are some of those compact, complex perfluorinated compounds that might be present in AFFF. We're envisioning that the first step in a remediation might be to subject them to bioremediation using the ability of microbes to break down that right-hand side of the molecule the part of the molecule that contain the carbon-carbon chains and the nitrogen and sulfur groups, leaving us the, uh, the carboxylic acids and sulfonic acids like PFOA and PFOS, and then to use some sort of chemical remediation method using things like sulfate radicals to break down the products of the biotransformation reactions. So what I've tried to do today is to give you a glimpse into the next generation of Superfund contaminants. And as I showed you, the first three decades of the Superfund contaminant were filled with research that were driven by the gas chromatograph with the electron capture detector. So we studied the fate, the health effects, and the remediation of sites where the chlorinated compounds like TCE and PCE and polychlorinated biphenyls and DDT were the contaminants of concern. But over the last decade, we've turned our attention to other parts of the periodic table and have used other tools like the liquid chromatograph and mass spectrometer to detect the presence of brominated compounds like the brominated flame retardants and fluorinated compounds like the fluorinated surfactants used in firefighting foams. And these compounds pose uh, unique threats to us or, or different types of threats that we're trying to address through our research. We're using some of the tools that we used in the past, like microbes, to bioremediate them, and we're applying new tools like sulfate radicals and other kinds of oxidants to break them down. So the Superfund program, just like the cavalry moving to the era of the tank, the Superfund program continues to evolve. We use new kinds of tools to study problems. We improve our science, learning from what we had in the past and drawing new kinds of skills in. And we hope that we'll be able to address this next generation of Superfund contaminants so they don't pose threats to human health. Thank you very much for your attention.